Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in this virtual space tonight. My name is Shuchi, and I'm the director of the Transnational Literature Series at Brookline Booksmith, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. The Transnational Literature Series considers themes of migration, the intersection of politics and literature, and works in translation. Before we begin, I just want to thank our friends at Deep Vellum Books, our partners for this evening's, this evening's launch of Christina Rivera Garza's latest book. Deep Vellum Books is an independent bookstore in Dallas, Texas, that specializes in international literature, independent presses, and marginalized writers. You can order books from them online. Um, they have a fantastic virtual book club called Book Cult, which meets the last Tuesday of every month, and they're soon launching their own virtual events. Um, you can find out more by visiting their website, and thank you to Deep Ellen for partnering with us. A quick Zoom webinar tutorial for those of you who aren't familiar with this format. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a few icons. One of those is a Q&A icon, where you can enter in your questions at any time during the conversation. Um, we'll do our best to get to as many of those as we can toward the end of the hour. Um, another button will get you to the chat window. That space is there for you all, so please feel free to chat during the event. Um, my colleague Pierce will be in the chat as well, dropping in useful information, including links to, to the books by our authors. Um, we do make every effort to keep these events free to attend in the hopes that you will purchase the featured book from us or our bookstore partner. So thank you in advance for taking a look and supporting independent bookstores. And finally, you can see us, but we can't see you, so relax and please enjoy the conversation. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Christina Rivera Garza, Sarah Booker, and Lena Maruane, all here to discuss Christina's latest book, Grieving, Dispatches from a Wounded Country, which was just published by this week by Feminist Press. Christina Rivera Garza is an award-winning writer, poet, translator, and critic. She's the recipient of the Roger Calvoy and Anna Seegers Prizes, and the only two-time winner of the Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz Prize. And just earlier this week, she was awarded the prestigious MacArthur Genius Grant. Congratulations. Um, she's currently a distinguished, pro distinguished professor of Hispanic studies at the University of Houston. Translator Sarah Booker is a doctoral candidate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she focuses on contemporary Latin American literature and translation studies. Her translations have appeared in the Paris Review, Asymptote, and the Brooklyn Rail, among others, and she is the translator of tonight's featured book. Moderator Lena Maruane is an award-winning Chilean writer and scholar. She has written a number of short stories, novels, and nonfiction books, among them the novel Seeing Red, which was translated by Megan McDowell and was awarded the Premio Val in Clown Prize for translation, and the novel Nervous System, and the nonfiction book Viral Voyages. She received the Sora Juana Inez de la Cruz Novel Prize, the Anna Seegers Prize, as well as grants from institutions such as the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. She currently teaches global cultures and creative writing at New York University. I'm so pleased to have these three here together tonight. And now, Christina, Sarah, and Lena. ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo están? Buenas noches. Such a pleasure to be here. And it's just so wonderful for me to see Sarah and Lena, uh, well, on the screen for now. But they are two of my favorite people, so thank you so much for joining me in the launching of this greeting, uh, Dispatches from a Wounded Country. Sarah is a wonderful, incredible translator and a source of patience all over the world. <laughs> and Lena is just uh, bright and talented and fierce. And so thank you so much for being here. What we decided to do today was to start with a, with a brief reading from the book. So we'll do that. Uh, I'll start and then Sarah. We'll continue. We're going to be doing a reading, uh, both of us, in English, because I understand that you are going to have access to a bilingual version of this essay that we're reading from. It's uh, precisely we're going to start off with the essay that I devoted to a book and an experience that belongs to Lina Meruane in this book and, uh, and the journey uh, that uh, took her grandparents uh, to, to Chile, where she was born. So um, let me start now with this section. Uh, this is the uh, essay uh, whose title is Writing in Migration, 
this segmentation with Lina Meruane, and I'm going to read the section called Chorus for Chorus Languages. Envolverse Palestina, Becoming Palestine, a book in which Lina Meruane explores with loving care the migratory journey that her grandparents made from Palestine to Chile in the middle of the 20th century, and in which she also embarks on a return to a place she has never before been all these years later, she pauses for a moment on what she calls tongues in bifurcation. These are her grandparents learning, conversing, hiding languages, selecting with mathematical precision the speech that would guarantee a citizenship that wasn't second class for their progeny. Arabic, Spanish, German, even though the information alone is only as reliable as the memory of her family members, it seems clear that her grandmother learned Spanish as a girl upon arriving in America, in the Americas, while her grandfather began to surmount the Castilian vowels when he was already a young man of 13 or 14 years, without also discounting all the German that came from the lessons at the religious European community schools that were in operation at that time. More than a disappearance of maternal languages, this has to do with layers of speech that by accumulating one on top of the other, far from erasing the previous ones, emphasize them with their own existence. There is something beneath the voice something ineluctable that nevertheless may go unnoticed. But not for those who have experienced the outside, sedimenting with each other, these porous languages open secret tunnels that in, the sol in their solidity allow the free passage of individual inflections, peculiar lilts, modulations that no one who isn't us could ever repeat. How many languages are hidden and how many allow their echoes to be glimpsed in the words we pronounce? Those of us who are products of long migration sagas might not know the answer, but we never stop asking the question. I'm going to continue with the section, Desedimenting Language. My paternal grandparents, like Lina Meruanes, left behind a land they would never return to. At the beginning of the 20th century, they turned their backs on their corner of San Luis Potosí after the dryness of the plateau had snatched their first son. They went north, and once there, they went even farther north. On the border between Coahuila and Texas, they became workers in the coal mines, and later, with a little luck, day laborers on the cattle ranches. Like many exiled during the Porfiriato era, of the late 19th and early 20th, early 20th centuries, my gran grandparents brought very little with them when they, left beyond, when they left beyond their arms and tongue. They spoke Spanish, that's true, but they also spoke something else, another tongue, the one they stopped using and that their children did not inherit, the one that will always be a matter of speculation. During the same period, my maternal grandma, grandparents crossed the border between Mexico and the United States, becoming cotton pickers and construction workers in huge Texan cities. To the Spanish they carried with them, they soon added English. And some 30 years after their arrival, when President Hoover initiated an aggressive deportation policy following the Great Depression of 1929, my grandparents and their tongues returned to Mexico. There, they carved out a life that extended to their children and grandchildren. They stopped talking about their expulsion so as to start talking about their welcoming. I learned little to nothing about these journeys, agreements, humiliations, meetings. In any case, Spanish settled into their bodies and there, in their lungs and throat, in their larynx, in their torrent of blood, it built this home. Just like Lina Meruane, who returned to Palestine without having been there before. In 1990, I returned to Texas when I believed I was arriving for the first time. My grandparents, who had worked tirelessly there, establishing through marriage the beginning of their family, created the footprint that, as Jose Revueltas would say, 
my return inhabited. Recognizing is different from knowing, but they are so similar. Now, after more than 30 years living in the United States, I'm sometimes asked about my accent. And these are acquaintances and friends from both the United States and Mexico who ask me. There is, of course, the backbone of Spanish, but at, at its side, in porous layers, also stretch those other languages that the migrations placed and blurred along the way. That which refuses to die, that rhythm I do not control and notice even less, is the genetic charge of sound in migration. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Can I mute? Mute. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I muted myself because I'm in New York and it's pretty loud in the street sometimes. Anyway, thank you, uh, Sarah, for that beautiful reading. And thank you, Christina, uh, for starting with that beautiful reading uh, about my family and your family, which uh, makes us both foreigners of everywhere, I guess. Uh, I want to congratulate you, Christina, for your uh, Genius MacArthur Prize just announced. I'm very excited about that. I want to thank Sarah for this amazing translation that reads as if one was hearing Christina speak, and we will talk a little bit about that. I also want to thank for this invitation uh, Feminist Press, uh, Lauren Hook and Jisoo. Uh, I have to say that Feminist Press is one of my favorite presses. My, I hope my editor is not hearing, listening to this. Uh, not only because of its great catalog, it's a very timely catalog, but also because they have um, uh, chosen uh, passionately to publish so many female Latin American uh, authors. And I think that is really of merit. Um, and also uh, last but not least, Di Bellum and uh, Shuchi uh, Saraswat, thank you for, for introducing us. I want to say that just briefly, I'm going to refer to this book just to introduce those who have not yet read the book. This is a book on, of course, language and writing about loss in many different kinds of losses. Of losses. Uh, and this is particularly a book about uh, violence in contemporary Mexico since always, but particularly since the post-revolutionary benefactor state was transformed into a neoliberal state following the US's dictates in the times of those terrible 1970s and 1980s dictators in Latin America. The neoliberal state, as you know, is the sort of state dedicated to making the rich richer at the expense of the working class and dedicated, as Christina writes, dedicated to the logic of maximum profit and minimum care. Um, these are the states that by definition, I mean, the, the, unfortunately, the state that by definition should be caring is the uncaring state that we live in today. And I hope we can also talk a little bit about that today. Um, but this is, um, I lost my point, but anyway, but this is uh, not all for Mexico because uh, the false promise of a system that would make everyone benefit and profit from capitalism gave way to the drug business, which became uh, a sort of de facto power in Mexico, another violent form of government within and without the Mexican state. Cristina, who grew up moving across the border and has remained in both countries, returning here and there always, knows all of this firsthand and she, together with other thinkers and writers, such as Sayak Valencia, denounce horror as the most extreme spectacle of power. The, ter the terrible violence uh, these two powers both exert against the Mexican people and particularly against women. But what is relevant about this book today is how, while discussing the Mexican case, the radical helplessness and defenselessness of its majority, it speaks to all of us about who and what we care for, about 
our numbness, our empathy, our ethical choices, and our grieving with others who are us and should be us. One can hear, as one reads this magnificent book, the distant echoes of Judith Butler and Susan Sontag and Sarah Ahmed and Rebecca Solnit and Gloria Sandua, to mention just a few. And one can hear as well the voices of the sufferers, the mothers, sisters, and daughters who are the survivors as well as victims. It is impossible, uh, Christina writes, it is impossible to grieve in the first person singular. Christina has written a book with so many others, a book that plays and replays the words of others as author, as collaborator, as curator, and even as collector. A book that allows a series of phrases, powerful phrases to repeat and return and become unforgettable. Uh, returning to the classics, this sentence, what country is this, Agrippina? Or citing the words of Luz Maria Davila, who was orphaned, so to speak, by the death of her two sons. You are not welcome here, Señor Presidente. So just as a brief introduction, thank you, Cristina, for writing this urgent book. And thank you for the amazing translation, Sarah. I will start precisely with this element, the writing. Why write a book about grief and grieving? And how did it take its hybrid form, its hybrid shape? This is a book of essay, but the essays are short, almost like vignettes. They're also portraits, they're scenes, they're poems that encompass both the fractured realities and the multiple perspectives. So why, why take upon yourself that sort of hybrid choice to talk about um, this contemporary issue and this sort of very difficult problem to address? Now I'll unmute myself. Thank you, Lena, for your introduction and your reading of this, of this book, and thank you for your questions. Um, I think there are two ways of answering this question. The first is a um, more practical aspect of it. Uh, um, a major component of this book uh, comes directly from uh, writings uh, that belong to a newspaper column I maintain in Mexico in a newspaper millennial for around seven years. So um, as I explained somewhere, um, the selection, I didn't know I was writing a book about all these issues until a reader and later the editor of this book alerted me about this possibility. He had been reading my column and, and he told me that uh, they were very interested, surplus editions and independent press out of the southern state of Tijuana, that they were very interested in publishing them. And it was then that I realized that having lived through uh, the so-called war on drugs, the war unleashed by then president uh, Felipe Calderon, had taken its toll that I had written a number of essays, a number of articles on these issues, just out of plain concern, just out of uh, being an observant member of the communities that I belong to, both in Mexico and later in the United States. We chose uh, uh, Surplus and uh, Saul Hernandez Vargas helped me to curate a selection of these essays. And later for this edition, we added some other more recent essays that I have been publishing both in Mexico and in the United States. And that's the reason why you are so right when you say that this is an exploration of Mexico, but always in connection with, very close to what happens to in the United States. Um, and what has been, has been part of my set of concerns as someone who is continuously moving across borders. Now, I have to pay attention to these, uh, as I said, out of uh, just uh, being, uh, you know, observant. Uh, I do believe that writing is not an isolated or individual practice. I believe that the writing is something I do uh, in close connection with others. Uh, if nothing else, just because of the real fact that I work with language and language belongs 
to entire communities, the communities that, that, that I belong to in some cases or I serve or I, I want to reach in any case. So later though, the, the, the questions became more and more complex and, and very close to home. Um, I don't think there is anyone in Mexico right now who could say that he or she has not lost something during these years. We all have. We all know someone who has lost someone, uh, or, or a friend of a friend who knows someone. We are very much connected by these wounds. And these are not nice worlds. Uh, you have to, to trail, so to speak. You have to, you have to work very closely with language in order to be able to encompass, to capture for a fleeting instant the complexity of what is out there. Pain is like that. Uh, suffering, the suffering of many is just like that. So I had to um, use whatever I had access to, uh, you know, all what I know about my trade, uh, all the notions received, such as genre, but at the same time, in order to, to use them and subvert them so that they would better serve the purpose of conveying lively, uh, urgently, these, these shared experience of, suffer, of suffering and, um, and criticism. That was the other point, that I didn't want to write uh, a story, and I don't believe that suffering turns us into passive victims of whatever is happening around us. I think there is power, there is illumination uh, in in uh, using the word of pain, the, the language of pain, the language of suffering, in order to explore the causes, the ultimate origins of, of the misfortune that, uh, that, that, that we have to, uh, um, to, that we confront in our daily lives. So there were many issues that, that I was trying to convey and I was trying to touch upon. And, um, and, that sense, I had to travel through uh, genre borders. I had to cross them too, and and use them uh, in as um, uh, dynamic a way as I could in order to part to make to share the experience. That that was uh, that was what um, what was very very much in my mind as I was writing the pieces, and later, as we were arranging the pieces, especially when we, we were trying to get them ready for this um, cross-border trip back into the United States. So, Cristina, you cross territorial borders in this book and in your life. Uh, you cross the border of languages. Uh, you also cross the border of genres. But I was also thinking that you, you cross sort of you cross the door and go into homes and talk to people. And I was thinking that that is sort of an amazing way of, of thinking through the question that uh, Spivak presented so many years back, can the subaltern speak, right? And I felt that this book is sort of also uh, takes on sort of the mission, the ethical question of not speaking for the others, but also including others, and namely that very uh, 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 beautiful piece and touching piece by uh, uh, Luz Davila. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to, to ask you if, if you had sort of taken that into account, sort of this not speaking over others, because one as a writer is a privileged person, even if one doesn't want to, one is because one writes and okay. publishes. No, absolutely, you are so right. Just the very fact that I was able to write about these experiences was the, the very confirmation of my privilege. Uh, I was um, undergoing tremendous, uh, uh, well, uh, I was also sharing the circumstances that I was talking about, but at the same time, I was safe enough to be able to write about them. And I have to recognize that and be, being uh, very clear about it. Uh, mm -hmm. both ethically and aesthetically. I think that's very important to me. And I tend to think of books, Lina, as, uh, as, um, as meeting places. 
right? I, uh, rather than uh, privileging the voice of the author, I see myself as someone who is paying close attention to what surrounds me. I believe that uh, those who sometimes are portrayed as voiceless do have voices. And what we at times lack are uh, the listening part of a conversation. And books in many ways can become that place uh, uh, for listening, for um, paying close attention to what other people close to us or far away from us are going through. So I do believe in that empathetic listening. I, I do believe very much that reading is a, a, a creative practice and it's part of a conversation that, that we engage with, uh, involving authors, involving these other voices that, that we call into play, that, um, that we, at least as, as authors that I, I want to uh, bring into page or screen. Uh, and, and I'm very much committed to continue with that conversation when the book is just set in place. Uh, this is just one a capture, so to speak, that the life of the book, I think, depends on this thing that we're doing right now, you know, talking through it, uh, bringing into our uh, daily conversations, expanding its life to reach other people's lives too. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I thought that it was a very poignant moment precisely in that uh, uh, piece, uh, The Longest Sunday, uh, where you distinguish yourself from the work of a journalist and you insist on not being a journalist because it seems that journalists are there to use that information rather than to establish a conversation sort of between two women who are two mothers who can sort of empathize with each other. But in terms of dialogue, I wanted to turn to uh, Sarah uh, also to talk about the ways in which you too established a dialogue through writing, because people might not know, but Christina also writes in English. And a few of these uh, chronicles were written, I think, originally in English. So I was wondering, uh, Sarah, how it is to engage in a conversation and to take the Cristina Spanish and, you know, version her Spanish into English in an English that will sound like Cristina's own English or not, right? And how was that conversation about sort of the, the language choices in this book and how also the uh, themes in this book affected you as a translator? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I was thinking as Cristina was speaking, um, about how writing is a, a form of dialogue in a way, continuing these conversations, that I think this translation process is another layer of that, another aspect of that. Um, and that I do, I find that translating with Christina, with, um, is very much, um, there is a lot of back and forth, there's a lot of dialogue to the process, which I feel very lucky to be able to, to be a part of that. Um, and now, yeah, I can say there's a lot of conversation that usually I'll do sort of a first um, initial translation of something and ask questions. And then we'll go back and forth on, um, on versions sometimes. And um, Christina frequently will add, add details, add extra information um, to the writing to kind of continue this dialogue. Um, and we'll, we'll go back and forth. Um, and there's always, I remember with the translating the Iliac Crest, there's all, always a couple words that, that will show up throughout the book that kind of are threaded through the narrative that pose some sort of translation challenge. And it, the Iliac Crest, it was the verb sedir that drove me crazy. Um, and in this, in a good way. Um, and I think in this one, we went back and forth for a long time about the, the notion of the estado sin entrañas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, about, and, that, and that's something I really value about working with Christina is that we're able to have these back and forth conversations of sometimes over months, it takes us months to kind of come to the term, the, yeah, the terms that we want to use. Um, and so we struggled with, she uses the, in Spanish, the estado sin entrañas, the the state without guts or without entrails. Um, 
to talk about which in the book is visceralist state right yeah. mm -hmm. exactly exactly and that's what we ended up ended up on but it, that went through multiple iterations because when she says estado sin entrañas it's not the only way time the term entrañas shows up that later you get entrañable which is kind of the opposite is this notion of caring um and intimacy and then and then you also get desentrañable um that continues to get played throughout. Um, and so we went back and forth. I think for a while we had the heartless state. Um, I was trying to find maybe a different organ that would be more related to a question of care and intimacy, but that didn't feel quite right. And I, I don't remember how we came to visceral, visceral relations and the visceralist state, but that, um, so I think that's an example of, of what it's like to translate. Christina and I get the dialogue that we have through the process. Yeah, that, that entrañable, oh my gosh, it, it, it was, it's still very difficult. And I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Sara, but I remember that one day we just, uh, we decided, okay, entrañable, the, the word in Spanish is, is, is uh, related to both uh, uh, you know, some element of the body, uh, but at the same time has these quality in terms of temperament and so being visceral and uh, uh, my my play that role too which is referring to both something uh, you know in terms of the character of a person but also the very specific part of the body still it's uh, uh, the use of that is it's, it's complex but i guess that's what we came up with and um, I actually, I actually have to say that I love visceral less good, because good, visceral good. is a very, very visceral world. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's sort of a, it's also a fresher term than heartless, which we have heard, and it's sort of mm -hmm. in the pop music and exactly. sort of points at a different direction. And here, mm -hmm. the sort of the viscerality of the politics are just so, so tremendous and so chilling, really. Well, so, dude, I'm really like it because yes. that we were going for that, so that's great. yes, no, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm, exactly. I'm with you. Yes, <laughs> and, and and regarding sort of this chilling element, not only is it about the writing. I have to say that I mean, um, we're talking about the privilege of writing, but also it has been seen in Mexico that those who write, many of them journalists, are actually putting their lives uh, in the front line of this so-called war. Um, I was thinking uh, whether that also, I mean, that risk, not only of writing about what is happening, but also the, the sort of more emotional risk of writing about these very difficult questions and about talking to people who are grieving so badly, and where empathy, I guess, is that movement of sort of body to body and soul to soul without a distance, eliminating the distance that usually protects us suffering of others. And so sort of these thoughts uh, brought up this question about sort of the risks of writing these books. How, how did you feel? Did you feel there was some sort of self-censorship, you know, both on the sort of on the, on the, on the themes and, 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 the, and the contexts and also the, the, the ways in which you wrote and the ways in which you, you yourself, Christina, involve yourself with uh, these issues? It's sort of the other side of privilege is actually breaking that place of privilege and sort of enmeshing yourself in that pain. We can't hear you. Sorry, yes, yes, I'm unmuting again. Um, you are right, it's, it's, a, it's such a complicated process and, and perhaps in addition to that, uh, involving oneself as, as an author without taking the spotlight, right? You know, using an eye that is at the same time involved yet discreet. I think that's, that's a, another difficult step to take here. And I was especially concerned about that when I met Luz Maria Davila, a woman that I admired so much. Uh, she's the, the, you refer to her as an orphan, and I think that's, uh, we lack a word to name uh, uh, women who have lost children, right? We know that children without a mother or a father are orphans, but we don't know how to call 
ourselves when we lose when we lose children or brothers or sisters, right? So let's let's call Luz Maria Davila for now an orphan in that sense. And uh, I read this piece at least four times. And uh, if you read the first version of uh, Dolerse in Spanish, this piece is written in a different form and from a different perspective. I had so many qualms. I have so many questions myself, because as you mentioned earlier, I knew I was not a journalist. And, and I do say that uh, knowing that, um, that, I, and that I have great admiration for what journalists do, especially those who uh, involve themselves, themselves so closely uh, that uh, to the point of risking their own lives. So, but I knew I wasn't, that was not my profession. I just wanted to meet Maria, uh, Maria Luisa Davila and I wanted to talk to her. And uh, 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 I just found myself often in, in, just there in her home, uh, short of words. Uh, and, and at one point when I, I realized I was crying, I was just uh, so ashamed of that. Uh, and then she was so generous that, that she consoled me, that she talked to me into just uh, uh, recomposing myself. And, and we were able to continue with our conversation. And I, I will never forget uh, her generosity, the way in which we were able to continue with this dialogue because she knew she wanted to have it. There were important issues she wanted to convey to me. Uh, she wanted, uh, she trusted me at that point, and, uh, and, uh, and in many ways, I think she entrusted me with a task that was dear to her heart and important to her politically, too. Uh, so, writing the piece after that experience was as complicated as going through the piece, because I, I wanted to to include myself as, uh, as the amateur uh, uh, <clears throat> interviewer right there, making all the mistakes that, that you could read in a journalist, uh, in a textbook. And at the same time, just fighting with, with uh, struggling with language and trying to get not only to the heart of the matter about her experience, but also to what brought me there, why I wanted to be close to her, why it was so important for me at that point in time to listen to her directly. And, uh, and of course, I, I thought that we, we, we shared uh, that kind of suffering, that loss. And uh, perhaps uh, I hadn't been able to, to touch upon my own loss. So it was a way of reaching out and trying to figure out how on this earth she was able to survive and, and to be so poised, so, so sure of herself, so strong, and at the same time so vulnerable right there in front of me. And so it took me several tries to, to write this piece. And if I have more time, I'm sure I will continue writing it again and again, uh, because this is the matter. This is actually the question about this type of writing. Uh, you have to be, you want to be very close, but you don't want to, or I didn't want to glamorize the scene. I didn't want to become the protagonist of that scene. Uh, I wanted to be there because I was there with all my, uh, shortcomings and, and with all my anxiety and, and with all that, the, that I see myself sharing with her, but at the same time, uh, and again, I wanted this to be her piece or the piece about me listening as closely as I was able to, uh, uh, to her experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, this is the kind of sort of responsible and ethical writing that, I, that one feels throughout the book, which is not only about Luz, there's, there's plenty of other protagonists and people who are mentioned and talked about and, and stories that we hear. So, um, but that kind of responsibility of going over and over, and it's also a book that I value because it's a book that is filled with questions. So not all the, the questions are answered. They're not all there because we don't know. And I think there's also sort of a, a sort of a, a truthfulness in that asking questions that are really hard to answer and that only perhaps can be answered locally at one point in one specific situation, etc. And you were talking, uh, Christina, about sort of not glamorizing and also not maybe uglifying either, right? Not making of Luz a victim and not making her a hero, right? Which are two extremes that are so much seen 
in novels, right, sometimes. And you uh, speak about sort of this, all these novels that were written about the violence in Mexico. And, uh, and I kind of felt that you were uh, exploring a sort of an exercise in dissent, that you yourself are not writing a novel about this. And I was wondering also why, what is wrong with, or what is, what is it that you don't like about sort of the novels or, you know, I can think of like as early on as uh, the underdogs, my Maria Nozuela, right, which is already a, a novel that is very paradoxical in my view. Um, but we have so many novels about uh, violence in Mexico. And I was wondering how you felt your book, uh, you know, was in dialogue or maybe not or in dissent with that uh, narrative tradition. Yeah, that's that's extremely interesting. I, um, you know, I have developed for a number of years certain suspicion about the power of fiction. I um, I shared that uh, uh, I, I I might be misquoting, but I remember uh, this uh, Norwegian author Nausgaard saying something along the lines of. Uh, that the power of fiction is, is close to nothing in a world in which everything has become fiction. And uh, I wouldn't put it exactly that way, but that helps me uh, about, uh, in many ways, um, I've written novels. I know how powerful it can be. I know that we can um, build worlds, uh, share experiences, share questions, perhaps um, trigger, uh, our imaginations, build new worlds together. I, I do ascribe a lot of power to, to that kind of writing too. But in, in the, as I was going through all these very tiring, uh, very trying times, I became very suspicious about fiction. And I was thinking there is such a, a close, uh, a slippery line between being concerned about the suffering uh, imposed and inflicted on, uh, on all these bodies uh, and, um, and the exploitation and excavation of other people's experiences. And, and that's a line that I, I wanted to keep very fresh in my mind and very much, that was my, my a compass in a way uh, as I was trying to approach these issues. I'm not saying that all novels are doing that, but specifically uh, in, in the relationship to the, to the set, of the range of concerns that were moving me, I was um, very much, as we say in Spanish, uh, tirando la toalla. I, I was just uh, <laughs> very suspicious. I, give, I had given up uh, on, on fiction as such. And I decided that, and that writing these nonfiction pieces, what, what here in the United States might be called uh, creative nonfiction at times, uh, might help me just go through that, um, um, th through that inner questioning. Uh, I have recovered, by the way, my, my faith in certain kind of fiction, and, and I just uh, released a novel last week. So, you know, I, I've, I've gone through that already, but at that point in time, I, I, was, I felt very desolate, and, and I felt that other kind of writing was, uh, was going to be more useful. And so that's, that's what I, I, I got there in, in, in Dolerse. And, and uh, there are beautiful and, and uh, thought-provoking, imaginative no novels about contemporary violence in Mexico. And there are novels that use stereotyping and novels that just uh, uh, exploit and excavate other people's um, uh, uh, pain. So there are both of them. And, and I think we have to be just alert about that, aware of that, and, and choose wisely. Uh, uh, the books that we read because we are in fact supporting a specific kind of worlds both in the present and in the future uh, based on those decisions. Mm -hmm. I am going to ask one more question because I think we're running out of time but I, I, I think we need to talk about certain things and this is my last question so please uh, if you have questions uh, you can send them on the Q&A and we'll try to address them as possible. You were saying that a moment of crisis seems to require as well a sort of sort of uh, a sort of facing the truth without fiction or as I felt it that way. I have also mm -hmm. had my moments of nonfiction. So I, I think I know what you're talking about. But I wanted to mention that we are now in a crisis 
And a crisis is a moment of reflection and a moment of questions. Um, you uh, say at some point in your book, uh, it is the forgetting of the body in politics as much as in personal terms, what opens the door for violence. And it feels like a very, very uh, important idea precisely today that we're facing a pandemic. And you end your, your book precisely when, with a very, very contemporary piece, a very present piece about uh, pandemic. Uh, maybe you could sort of uh, tell us uh, how you think that we can, um, we can sort of think about this moment when everything seems to be in crises, when language cannot speak properly about uh, what is going on, and when it doesn't seem to be able to capture its object because it seems to be a new object, although probably it's also very old. C could you maybe, you know, <laughs> before we take questions, uh, address that sort of this moment of pandemic and how language might, and the questions might help us through this moment? Yeah, well, as, as many of us, I think this pandemic has uh, forced us to revise uh, our sense of uh, normalcy, uh, our sense of uh, what to expect and, uh, and what to take for granted. And one of the aspects that came up to me as, as we were just entering uh, um, the quarantine days, the sheltering in place days, those early days of March, which seem so far away right now, uh, one of the things that struck me uh, uh, more forcefully was the fact that uh, in our, at least that happened to me in my day, in my daily life, it was so easy to forget that, that I have a body and to forget that things, that objects, that relationships are all embodied. Uh, and it seems to me that capitalism as a system and the state uh, under which we live now, uh, they benefit greatly by this um, strategic uh, act of oblivion. Uh, and uh, something, there are many things, many dangerous things about this pandemic. The way in which, for example, the shortcomings of our uh, health system became uh, more clear than ever, right? But in addition to all, the, all that stuff, which is very practical and very true, I was struck by the fact that uh, when we were told to be very careful about the things we touched, and, uh, it, uh, uh, you know, just going to the supermarket, buying stuff, uh, touching those fruits, cans, uh, bags, became such a, such an, uh, a politically charged act. And I'm saying this because at that point in time, we were asked to think about the many hands that had touched uh, these objects uh, previously. And if we, we continue with this train of thought, we had to go all the way back to who made them, to whose hands are responsible for that production. And once we get there, we have to think about who is responsible for the world uh, that we enjoy. To, to, we, we have to think about the bodies of men and women working on the fields, the bodies of men and women working in factories, and about labor relationships, and about salaries, and about health conditions. And we have to revise our whole sense of what makes us, uh, 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 our life, I, I mean to say, possible as it is or, or as it was. And so I took that as, a, as an important lesson, a lesson um, in, um, in remembering what shouldn't be forgotten and uh, in not taking for granted these bodiless experiences. It seems to me that the, the ones benefiting from this kind of thought are always those who exploit us and there are many trying to do so at the slightest provocation. So um, um, just uh, being very aware that it's, it's not I write with the body, not with the mind. I write with my whole being. I live my life, not with only with my mind, but with my whole being. And my body, as such, acquires, has, by the virtue of being, a matter, has responsibilities to others, in connections to others. And I depend closely, uh, 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 I depend on others. And uh, just, I think if we, go through that and we don't let ourselves just go through the motions and and force us to remember that basic truth i think we 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 could get up and vote this early november and try to change the world as it is right now 
Thank you so much, Christina and Sarah. I'm sorry we went over time, but it was hard not to. Oh, no, you didn't go over time. We have just a couple questions, and I think we want to end with a very brief reading. Um, so let's um, go to the questions. And thank you guys. Oh, by the way, that was, um, that was an extraordinary conversation. Um, and we didn't go over, so don't worry, Lena. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> um, so the first question is from Kristen MB, and she says, I enjoyed the playlist you included in the Taiga Syndrome. What inspired you to include it, and are there any songs or sounds that would accompany your new book? Oh my gosh, uh, thank you for asking uh, uh, and for having read that other book. Uh, and, I, um, and I'm not so sure what, uh, if the question relates to this new book as this book or the new book that I just published that was just released that week. But what I can say about this book is that I work with these, with uh, the pieces included in Grieving as I do with many other ones, which is paying very close attention to the rhythm and sound and silences of words. I usually write and enunciate at the same time. So that's the reason I, I usually don't listen to music as I write. And I included that playlist in, in the Tiger Syndrome because that was a very unique experience. I was trying to uh, alter my own uh, sonic pattern, so to speak. And in this case, it's just the, the, the sounds and the rhythms of the words that I was uh, getting uh, to listen as, as I wrote this book. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and this question is for Sarah. Um, aside from the collaboration or dialogue that you, oh, this, and Allison Wright asked this question. Um, aside from the collaboration or dialogue that you shared with the author, to what extent do you think the similarity in your heritage to that of Christina contributed to the quality of your translation? My, our heritage, shared heritage? Mm -hmm. Um, interesting. Are you Mexican, Sarah? Are you Mexican, Sarah? We didn't know. No, <laughs> I don't think we have much shared heritage, except for the, your grandparents' time in, on this side of the border, but that would still be pretty um, removed from me. Um, oh, that's interesting. I have not thought about that a lot. Um, Perhaps the dissimilarity helps? Maybe the dissimilar, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think I could say that I, I approach translation perhaps, I'm attracted to translation or drawn to it perhaps because of not having some sort of more intimate or close relationship with another, another language. Um, Spanish being the, the language that I'm most interested in um, and that I, I'm drawn to the opportunity that translation gives me to, to intimately engage with with this other language and with these other writers and thinkers um, and to think about different different ways of using language. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and Christina, I'm gonna pass it back to you for a final reading. Yes, yes, yes. Well, before we go through some of the um, uh, little uh, brief paragraphs in the last piece of this book, Keep Writing. Let me just, uh, I'm, I'm looking for those pieces as I speak. Uh, let me just uh, thank profusely Lina Melone and, and Sarah Booker for sharing this moment with me. I admire you both uh, <laughs> tremendously. You are an inspiration for me. And um, uh, Sarah has been so close. She, she has become, we haven't met in person. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. This is just uh, uh, amazing to me that, that we know each other very closely. Uh, I consider Sarah a friend and a co-author. Uh, we, we get to talk about things that I hardly talk to, you know, with any other, even close friends. Uh, so I can say that we know each other intimately, right? In the sense that we are discussing every little detail of, um, of, these, uh, of these works and these translations. And I have to say that Sarah is also extremely patient. So being an impatient person myself, that is a trait that I totally like. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. 
And Lina, uh, we, we started a conversation a, a while ago in New York, and ever since I've been uh, a devotee of your books, and I listen and read whatever you write, it's just wonderful. So thank you both for being here. And uh, right now, let me see, I just want to share some of uh, uh, pieces of the, the text uh, with which this uh, grieving uh, concludes. Keep writing. Let me see. Because we become social in language. My I for you, your he for me, your you all for them. Because writing by nature invites us to consider the possibility that the world can, in fact, be different. Because the secret mechanism of writing is imagination. Because imagination is another word for criticism, and this the other word for subversion. Because those who write will never adapt. Because memory. Because writing teaches, teaches us that nothing is natural. Things are closer than they appear. Writing also tells us that. Because it is through the rectangular artifact we call a book that we communicate with our death and all of the death are our death. Because a sentence produces memories that will be inhabited by the names of Marco and Jose Luis Piña Davila, Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, January 30th, 2010. Because Samantha is hung here that reads, tell, tell them not to kill me. Because belonging is something I do through you, sentence. Because a line is an imprecation, imprecation or a prayer. Because terror stops there where the word terror stops, inscribed. Because there are voices that come from afar, from below, from beyond. Because within books, I always greet the unfamiliar that I have become so familiar with because everything starts indeed with a sign. Because a sentence produces memories that will be inhabited forever by the name of Lucila Quintanilla, Monterrey, Nuevo León, October 6, 2010. Because in the re rectangle of the page, I am nourished and I dream and I plunged and I die because there too, I am reborn, we are reborn because yes is a small and sacred and savage word all at the same time because a mantra is hung here that reads we are a country in mourning because Sent, a sentence produces memories that will be inhabited forever by the name of Liliana Rivera Garza, Mexico de F, July 16, 1990. Because I do not forget, because I will not forget, because we will never forget. Thank you so much for uh, joining us in this reading. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Thanks to Feminist Press um, for being here. Oh, yes, I forgot to say that. I'm sorry. I have to interrupt you that I thank everybody. And I didn't say how grateful I am for the work, uh, uh, Laura and Jesus, and everybody at Feminist Press. All the work that they do is fantastic. And I have to thank Sarah too, because she was the one who reached them. She was the one who made the call. And uh, uh, this collaboration is, is been possible thanks to her work as a translator and her work as an instigator too. So <laughs> thank you, Sarah, again, and thank you, Feminist Press. Yes. Yeah, no, I wanted to add a, an extra thank you to Lauren Hook as well, who's an unbelievable editor. Yeah. And thank, thank you to everybody for hosting. Hi, this incredible book. Um, thank you all again. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lina. Thank, thank you, so you Christina. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Bye-bye.